So I'm a dad at Crossroads. My kids are in the front row, Jake and Andy. And I love Crossroads. And I love Crossroads because it does something very important as someone who works in his career with entrepreneurs. It teaches you how to learn. It teaches you the joy of learning. And in a world where we have too much rote memorization, Crossroads, for me, does exactly what our students need in today's world. But Crossroads is also a great metaphor for my talk today, which is literally a crossroad. You're in a street, and you have two or three choices about where you're going to go in your lives. And there's many high schoolers in this room, so I want to talk especially to you. You have to realize that two generations ago, your grandparents maybe had two, maybe three choices in their careers in their lives. There weren't a lot of crossroads. They were kind of left to the life that they were born into. Two generations before that, so your grandparents that you probably met, God willing, are still alive, but you probably met, their grandparents, not so long ago, existed in a world with no commercial aviation, with no interstate highways, with about a billion and a half people on the planet, and where the vast majority of those billion and a half were in prearranged marriages. There were no crossroads. You were dealt the life you were dealt, and you got on with it. So it's this great gift that our parents and their parents and their parents have given us this crossroads. And yet, in an Instagram world, we can always second guess the choices we make. And in fact, what I want to tell you is, make adventurous choices and own them and live with them and understand that they are your best choices and not to look at the road that might have been. So I want to talk about your journeys. I'm a venture capitalist. I get paid to give people money. It's not that hard to be popular when you get paid to give people money. And you may know something about venture capital because you've probably seen this show, Shark Tank. They give out money. Uh, I'd say the biggest difference is they give out hundreds of thousands of dollars. We give out millions, tens of millions, sometimes up to 50 million to one company. And where they try to maximize their ownership, I watch every one of those shows thinking they should be minimizing their ownership. That sounds crazy. But what I've learned is that by empowering the most innovative people, the most ambitious people in the world, empowering them with true ownership and giving them smaller amounts of money, they achieve much greater things than if they all feel like managers. And so we gave about $30 million to a company you may know. If you're in high school, you love. If you're their parents, I apologize. You will grow to love it as we talk about CO2 reduction and reducing congestion in the world. We have to have solutions like Bird. If you know GOAT, does anyone know GOAT? I can't see your hands, but I'm guessing a good portion of the high schoolers do. This started as a restaurant reservation booking app. Two young, really ambitious, talented, product-oriented startup founders in LA, they pivoted to GOAT, which is now amongst the fastest growing companies in Los Angeles, will sell hundreds of millions of dollars of sneakers this year. Four and a half years ago, it didn't exist. We funded a company many of you heard of earlier today called Ring. We were the first institutional round with Jamie Siminoff. Uh, Shark Tank passed. Another positive for us. <laughs> but he went on to build this amazing company that now controls the doorbell security market in the United States, reducing the cost for middle class families to have security and sold to Amazon, I don't know if he announced it, but rumored to be north of a billion dollars. Uh, rumors are usually pretty accurate. <laughs> but we also fund hard sciences. So we found a team out of UC Santa Barbara, PhD in material science, that found a way to extract molecules from the stems of plants, create a film outside the plant, 
And it does two things. It seals in moisture so the plant doesn't oxidize. So if you look at a banana or an avocado, the, the part that's porous is where the oxidation begins. But number two, it fools the bacteria into thinking the whole plant is a stem. Bacteria doesn't attack the stem because it doesn't see that there's going to be any nutrients. So we've been able to get three weeks of extra yield on crops. What that means is reduction of water, reduction of wastage. 40% of all produce in the United States is wasted before it's eaten, 70% in the developed world. And to the young lady who spoke earlier about you reducing your meat-based consumption and looking at CO2 reduction in your personal lives, which I think is a great message, but we also have to attack the supply chain, and that's what Appeal does. Uh, we gave them um, $5.7 million just out of their PhD program. They've gone on to raise more than $100 million. They're rolling out across Costco, uh, Ralph's, the local store here, and several other chains. We funded a team out of Israel called Bionaut that's designed a way to take a micro robot. So these robots you see are 100 microns small. You can't see them with the human eye. It's smaller than hair. But what it can do is, using magnets, it can go through the tissues of your body, the brain, the eye, lungs, kidney, liver, and deliver micro doses of chemotherapy and potentially extract tumors without surgeries. We're in one year into our animal trials. You have to do three years of what's called in vivo trials, but that company is being built in Los Angeles. And then we get to fund, fund some fun stuff, like we just funded a company out of France that designs motor bags for motorcycles, airbags for motorcycles. And so we've had seven high-speed accidents since we've deployed these now across Europe with zero fat fatalities. People on motorcycles no longer die from head injuries at the same rates they once did. They die from injuries to the thorax, which we can present, uh, prevent. Uh, the French Olympic team wore these during the Olympics, and we're now rolling out for equestrian. Where I see the vision is a world in which these can exist for seniors, for protecting their hips and their knees and their shoulders and the things, the maladies we know. So many of the inventions we see can improve our daily lives. So we invest about $100 million a year. We manage a billion and a half dollars. I run the firm. Um, so how did I get here? How did I wind up doing this? And what thoughts can I give you as you begin your journey? I just want to tell you six quick stories. This is me at 18. About the only thing I had in common with Brett Kavanaugh, I liked beer. <laughs> this is me buying my first legal beer in Hawaii. It used to be 18 years old. But the other thing I want to point to in this picture is I played basketball, soccer, and ran cross country, but in my junior year, they shut down a local high school. They merged them together, and I moved from point guard to a position I had never played in my life, left out. And I found myself no longer a member of the basketball team, and so I decided to be a leader in the cheering section. And I designed these t-shirts, the actual one I'm wearing right there, and I created my first company at 16 in high school. I don't know why. I just chose to do that. In the same way, I see people like Derek Tong helping organize an event like TEDx Crossroads without really understanding what he's doing or why, but uh, I meant why, not what. Done it extraordinarily well. And the interactions that he's having with speakers, with the crowd, with presentations, with learning how all this is done, like these are the foundations of what you build. So my six stories. The first is you don't ask, you don't get. I started as a computer programmer, which in 1991 was very unsexy. Um, I sat at my computer every day programming. And I did that for about three and a half years. And I developed a specialty, which is the emergence of the internet was distributed computing. And in 1994, I was one of the experts in distributed computing. So in 1994, pre-World Wide Web, many of my friends quit their jobs to go to Silicon Valley and go do startups, which also wasn't sexy back then. And I chose a different path, inspired first by one of my closest friends from high school who had gone to live in Spain, he'd gone to live in South America, and he came back a changed person. 
a lot, his eyes a lot more open to the world, and I wanted that. So my mom took me on a trip to Paris and then to Israel, and that inspired me to want to go see and live in the world. So I found a group of people in the office of the company I was in. It's now called Accenture. It was called Anderson Consulting back then. And I would bug them every day on email saying, you must have projects that need someone with my skills. Would you please staff me? And they kept saying, well, I'll try, but they could never find anything. So they introduced me to a guy named Valentine Bonger. He was um, an associate uh, partner. And I heard he was going to be in San Francisco, so I flew to meet him, and I just left it all on the table, and I begged him to take me, and I said, this is going to be great. And he, really nice guy. We got along. But he said, I got nothing. We don't have any projects for you. So he went back, and I was kind of devastated. And then I found out that his boss, his name was Corey Van Wolveler. And I started writing my friends, and I said, I don't want or need anything from you. I just want to know when Corey Van Wolveler is going to be in the United States. So I got my team of spies <laughs> plugged into his calendar. It's a true story. Found out when he was going to be in Chicago. And I wrote to him, and I said, what a coincidence. I'm going to be in Chicago. I heard you're going to be there. Would you meet me at the airport? And he wrote back and said yes. I wasn't actually lying. I was planning to be there. I just didn't tell him it was conditional upon him agreeing to meet me. So I literally flew to Chicago. I didn't have a lot of money. I was in my early 20s. I flew out there. I stayed on a couch of some friends. And I went to the airport. And we both had a beer. And we sat. And I tried to persuade him that he should take me to France to work on his team. And he said to me, I don't need any more Americans. I have too many. I said, OK. Um, but I have technical skills, and I know distributed computing, and that's going to be really important. He said, my whole team has distributed computing skills. That's what we do. And I said, OK, well, you know, I'm pretty good at sales. I think I could get sold onto a project. He said, we don't have any demand. I don't need you. So we had a 45-minute nice conversation. It was winding down. Flights were getting ready. And I said to Corey, look, you have the power to change my life. You have the power to make everything I've worked for come true. And the cost to you is pretty small. I promise you, if you take a chance on me, I will work my ass off to make you not regret it. And he picked up his bear, and he looked at me. And he said, Mark, you're a pain in the ass. <laughs> but fine, I'll take you. And he did. And he changed my life. And I spent the next... 11 years living and working in Europe and Asia. Uh, the red are the places I live, the white are the places I worked. I had been there for about three and a half years, and I set new sights on myself, Japan. And my second message for you is it's better to beg for forgiveness than ask for permission. Don't tell your parents I told you this. But if your intentions are good, nobody in life rolls out the red carpet for you. You need to roll it out and then convince people that they need you. So I wanted to work in Japan. I asked my local team. They told me it'll never happen. So I started logging onto our systems, finding projects in Japan. I found one with the name Greg Copy, uh, project for Sony, for the board of directors of Sony. And it said internet strategy. And I said, I know something about the internet. So I called Greg Copy. He was based in San Francisco. The project was in Tokyo. And I said, Greg, I would love to be on this project. He said, well, it hasn't sold yet. There's a kickoff meeting on such and such date, and we'll know after that. So I get off the phone. And I thought, well, once they sell the project, they can pick anybody. I better get there before they sell the project. So I booked a flight. I flew to Tokyo. I arrived on a Saturday. I showed up at the Tokyo office on Monday. I walked in. They looked at me like, what is this crazy gaijin doing here? They're very polite in Japan. They invited me in, and then they freaked out, like, what the hell is this guy doing here? So they pick up the phone later in the day, and they call Greg Copy in San Francisco. They say, well, we have this guy. What, what do we do with him? So Greg gets on the phone, and he says, Mark, what are you doing there? I told you the kickoff meeting was next week. And I said, yeah, I'm here to prepare for the kickoff meeting. And he said, but I didn't tell you to go. And I said, oh, I'm really sorry. I thought you needed help. I'll, I'll fly home. And he said, well, while you're there, you might as well help them prepare for it if you're already there. So I did. 
I bet on myself. I worked my ass off during that week. I went to the presentation. We sold the project, and I stayed and worked in Japan for six months. At the end of the six months, they invited me to transfer permanently to Japan. But I had other plans. I bet on myself. I went and created a startup. I quit my job nine months before making associate partner. I had the golden handcuffs were just starting to tighten. And I said, I don't want that. So I moved back to Europe and started a company. Luckily for Jake and Andy, moving back meant that I went back to my girlfriend, now wife. So I made the best choice in my life. Best choice for them, anyway. And uh, <laughs> in addition to me. And I bet on myself. I cut my salary in half, and I went and built a startup. And I built that for six years. I sold that to a French publicly traded company. And I moved back to the United States with nothing. I mean, other than having sold my company, made a little bit of money, but just starting from scratch again. I built up a new company in Silicon Valley. And I wanted to do a deal with the most prominent business company in San Francisco, business software company called Salesforce.com. And I couldn't get them to return emails. I know they wanted to partner with a company like me, but I couldn't get them to return emails. They were about an hour. I lived in Palo Alto. They were in San Francisco, one Market Street. And I would show up every day, open my laptop, and work in the Starbucks in the lobby of one Market Street because they came down for Starbucks twice a day. And by doing that, I got to know the entire executive team at Salesforce.com, including the CEO, Mark Benioff, who I bumped into at the same Starbucks. They ended up buying my company. And through my journey, I changed my life. I decided then not to stay at Salesforce, very hard decision. I decided I wanted to be a VC. So I called up the people who had given me money before, based in Los Angeles. And I said, uh, what do you think about hiring a new partner? They said, great idea, but we haven't raised our new fund yet, and we're not ready for new partners. And I said to them, well, OK, can I fly down to meet you anyways? So I did. And I said, look, if you raise a new fund, you'll have any choice you want of partner. How about if I join now and help you raise the fund? And they said, well, we don't have the money to pay you. And I said, look, anything you pay me is better than what I'm going to pay myself as an entrepreneur, so this is a blessing. Let me join. And I didn't accept no for an answer, and I ended up joining uh, what's now Upfront Ventures in 2007. I then chose to build a personal brand. I invested in a blog. I started tweeting. Believe it or not, I even put out content sometimes on Snapchat. And by building a direct relationship with an audience, I suddenly had all these people follow me and all this power. And in 2011, when we went to raise the second fund since I joined, the people who invest in VC funds were telling my partners, we want to give you money, but we want Mark to be the partner, the managing partner. So despite having four partners who had worked at the firm many more years than me, four years into my tenure, I became managing partner in 2011. So the messages I want to leave you with is you don't ask, you don't get. Beg for forgiveness. Bet on yourselves. Be politely persistent. The polite part, don't forget. Get your foot in the door. Build a brand. But mostly, for the people about to go out and experience your lives, I want to encourage you to take risk. Pragmatic risk, but risk with your career choices, with your studying choices, with your life choices. Experience life. Not everything is a mobile phone. I love my mobile phone as much as you do. But experience life. Take risks. Come to the crossroads in your life. Make hard choices, even if it doesn't seem like what everybody else is doing. But the important message I want to finish on, there's no bad choices. This is 2018. The world has been handed to you. Yes, we have to do a lot to save it. They've had to do a lot to save this world for the last few hundred years, too. When you look on Instagram and you feel like everyone else is doing something, just understand that your burden, your burden of choice on those crossroads that you take isn't a burden. It feels like it. It's a gift handed to you by many generations. And uh, what journey are you going to take? Thank you.